lifetime, you start to think about these changes. It's like now, with the computer revolution and the internet revolution, which you're all, many of you have grown up with, um, <coughs> oil fuel trains and cars superseded the foot, the horse and the human foot, as the main means of transportation. Sound and light waves began to take the place of face-to-face -face communication. This was the first telephones, the first electric light bulbs, uh, the wireless, Marconi, the radio would come in in a little while, all during this lifetime. Not surprisingly, in this mechanistic climate, dance was not respected. And if we could have the next slide, please. There's one. There we go. Yeah. So most dance that people saw were music hall dancers. They were frivolous. Um, the, the plot lines were ridiculous. It was a not a good place for respectable women to go, and, and, and you know, even respectable gentlemen went to see bare legs. In those days, they talked about there was a song of old Cole Porter song, "A Glimpse of Stocking Is Something Shocking." Dance was a leg show. It was linked with sexuality. It was not respected. Next slide, please. The ballet looked like this. We think of ballet as this beautiful, flowing art form. But the dancers in those days wore corsets just like everybody else did, and the plots were really, really silly. The Great Romantic Ballet, for those of you who have appreciation, um, they, that had the great era of the Romantic Ballet was over by 1850 and had been all forgotten. Dance was defined as this frivolous leg show. So, how did Isadora become a dancer? Why would she? Next slide. Her unusual home life was a great incubator, as it is for many artists. Her father, Joseph, um, was a charming banker and a poet. He was also an embezzler and a bigamist who deserted the family when Isadora was an infant. Next slide. Her mother, Mary Dora, was forced to find ways to support the family, and she did this by working at home knitting, and she also taught piano lessons. And um, one of the ways that her children made a living was by selling her knitwear on the street. And Isadora and her sister Elizabeth taught social dance to young children. Isadora claimed that she was uh, teaching us as young as she was, uh, as young as six years old. She was essentially homeschooled. They gathered around the piano and listened to their mother play classical music, which would be very important in Isadora's choreography. And they read Shakespeare to each other. She had three. Uh, brothers and sisters. And really importantly, her mother was an atheist and a free thinker. Isadora had very little formal schooling. She was mostly self-educated. When they left San Francisco to pursue their fortune, they became a troop of traveling players on they rode the uh, they took the trains and they would get off at each station and they would put on little acts and they would dance and you know sing and recite poetry in order to earn a living, they went on their way to New York. Well, again, how did Isadora become a dancer? She claimed to have started dancing in her mother's womb. She was pretty flowery language. My mother dying on oysters and champagne, and I, you know, stimulated by this, began to dance in my mother's womb. Right? Well, maybe not so much. Um, they couldn't have afforded it, right? She did study ballet briefly. Next slide. And this is, yeah, you can barely see. This is Marie Bonfanti, who was the chief ballerina of the scandalous Black Crook, which, again, the leg show for the dancing girls, and preachers preached against the scandalous show. Naturally, they, you know, the tickets were sold out for months on end. But Isadora's real teachers were nature and the human body. She had, and especially for her era, an incredible ability um, to observe kinetically and to feel in her own body. So she watched children at play, running and skipping and jumping and leaping. She grew up, I think I should have said, in California by the sea. And she began to be inspired by waveforms. Um, she also, with the sense of the wave, which I'll talk about a little more later, became aware of the force of gravity and the power of gravity in nature and how we move. 
So she begins this, the, the dance of the future. Why don't you just go ahead and blank that out if you would. She begins the dance of the future um, by connecting us to the earth. I believe in the religion and the beauty of the human foot, she says. And again, the only place that almost anyone would ever see bare legs in her day was at a music hall. One of my favorite reviews of her uh, in her early days in Chicago was um, the, 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 the reviewer writes, she came forth on the stage and one of the legs extended from a rose-colored drapery full length and skin color. Why was it skin color? You tell me. It was? Thank you very much. Skin. You can say it. You can talk to me. I love to talk. I'll ask you. You do one or two things later to help me out. Um, I believe in the religion and the beauty of the human foot. And the foot connects us to the earth and bounds us to nature, which in turn links us, according to Isadora, to all humanity. If we seek the real source of the dance, if we go to nature, we find that the dance of the future is the dance of the past, the dance of eternity that has been and always will be. In some ways, she didn't think of herself as, as making up movement, but almost as discovering movement that was almost already present in nature. The most important sources of her work, the evolutionists Darwin and Hackel, Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy, Walt Whitman's poetry, and the educational theories of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, classical Greek art, her family milieu, in other words, she was like a sponge for the great currents, the great knowledge that was going on around her. She used the word nature in two ways. First, in the larger sense of mother nature, but secondly, in the sense of nature as the essential quality of an individual. Quote, the movement of the free animals and birds remains always in correspondence to their nature and its correspondence to the earth nature. So again, what you have is a linking of the individual to the earth and, as you'll see, to the larger universe. This dual sense of nature leads her to groundbreaking <coughs> ideas like the dance of no two persons shall be alike. And that is at the root of modern dance choreography, where we go into the studio, turn to our bodies as a source, and try to create dances that are uniquely our own. <coughs> it also generates what she sees as the dancer's task to find those primary movements of the human body from which shall evolve the movements of the future dance in ever-varying, natural, and unending sequences. Darwin's evolutionary theories confirm what she experienced in the dancing. Evolution, as we all know, shocked Western culture. It's still a huge issue for many people today because it seemed to destroy the order of biblical creation. But Isadora understood that evolution unites us with nature in its endless variety. Again, the breaking down of dualism. She knew through her dance that you could be true to nature as an individual and part of nature on a grand scale. Is the flower less beautiful for understanding about roots, she wrote. When dance helps us find movement that corresponds to our form, our movement becomes natural and beautiful like that of the three animals. Next slide, please. She was intrigued by classical Greek art, and she wrote of the Dionysian ecstasy expressed in movements where the head is thrown back as you move through space. Next slide, please. Um, and I wanted to just show you that. Um, so the Dionysian, and you know Dionysus, you know who Dionysus was in Greek mythology? Who? Uh-huh. Who? What's Dionysus? Somebody say yes? You can answer. Who was Dionysus? Um, the goddess of, God of, of wine. Of wine. The god of wine, but also the god of, oh gosh, just letting it all go, letting it all hang on. So Isadora had this movement 
But she named the Dionysia, and she, she thought of this head flung back pose. I can the go to the next slide and see if it's there. Um, of the, of the, uh, of the, um, of just, you just, ah, oh, you know. And so she created this movement, which she uses in many different ways in her choreography. You'll see it very gently in the dance I do at the end, where you begin by curving into yourself and going forward, the movement rises up through your body and just pours out into the universe. And you can do it quickly and slowly and running and skipping. And um, it's just this is this great kind of waveform as the movement travels, you know, through you and back and forth. <clears throat> where are we? Where are we? So the Dionysian was a, a really important aspect of the uh, philosophy of Frederick Nietzsche, and Nietzsche referred to uh, Isadora thought of Nietzsche uh, and his. His book, um, oh, I just wrote that in my head. <laughs> what is books? Um, I can see the book, I can see the, never mind, it'll come to me. Um, 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 um. And she called Nietzsche's, look at this, in my script, no wonder, there's, it says, she calls Nietzsche's, and then I left the title out, her Bible, and always had it at her bedside. Nietzsche leaks, <laughs> Nietzsche, sorry, Nietzsche leaks nature. Right? And the Dionysian, which you want to think of as an elemental force of the universe. And he says, under the charm of the Dionysian, not only is the union between man and man reaffirmed, but the union with nature, which has become alienated, hostile, or subjugated, and is celebrated, and nature celebrates once more with reconciliation with her vast son, man. Nietzsche famously wrote of the will to power. His ideas inspired Isidore to combine the will of the individual and the will of the elemental forces of nature in her dance. She wrote, the movement of the universe concentrating in an individual becomes what is termed the will. For example, the movement of the earth being the concentration of surrounding forces gives to Earth its individuality, its will of movement. And I always picture the planet spinning, spinning, spinning through space. The dance should simply be the natural gravitation of this will of the individual, which is no more and no less than a human translation of the gravitation of the universe. So again, we have this link between us and the larger experience of nature and elemental forces. She derived her concept of will from the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, who thought of will as mindless, aimless, a non-rational urge at the foundation of our instinctual drives and the foundational being of the universe. So the will for Isadora is not only what empowers individuals, it links us to nature and through nature to the cosmos. Reason <coughs> is no part of this movement. Dancing with the, sword, the force of gravity, and you know she mentioned the will of gravitational will of the universe, is the source of much of the power of Isadora's technique. Next slide, please. There's our Dionysian, and you was it. Next slide. There we go. Um, this is a slide of an ideal, idealized ballet dancer. And what I want you to notice is the absolutely straight line through the standing leg to the top of the head, and also the circular line uh, that the foot is tracing. Ballet, um, as many of you know, gives the illusion that gravity does not exist. Right? You go up. But the other interesting thing about ballet is it is based on the geometry of the circle, and even when you brush your leg, the way that that circular path goes, you're reaching down and out, and you're always finding this sense of classical balance. And the individual is framed within this circle to present him or herself to, from the origins of ballet, the king, right? So you're always contained within this circle, and the, the, the kind of focus on the diameter of the circle is the king. So you get this kind of abstract classical balance. 
You have absolute steps, as again, many of you know, in ballet, and your job is, as a dancer, is to fulfill the impossible perfection of those steps. Isadora, based on the act, you know, felt ballet, based on all this abstraction, was sterile. She says, the expression of the modern school of ballet, where each action is an end and no movement, pose, or rhythm is successive or can be made to evolve into succeeding <coughs> action, is an expression of degradation, of living death. All the movements of our modern ballet are sterile because they are unnatural. Their purpose is to create the delusion that the law of gravity does not exist. And again, when you're at the ballet bar, for all you ballet dancers, that's what you thought. Um, never mind the beauty of it today, you're going back through center, right? And you're always completing that circle. You're dealing with a palma, the same thing. It's, it's this perfect classical line, and your job is to fulfill it within that classical balance. Likewise, if you think about the preparation for pirouette, dot, 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 stop. I mean, the greatest dancers you still see the preparation. In Duncan, one movement evolves to the next movement. The walk is this continual flow with your toe embracing the earth and your center, just the, the, the weight of your center carrying you forward against the pull of gravity. You can see this sense of that I'm almost moving through water as I do this. Not that your arms are back here, but there's a sense of you and the forces of nature that shape your dancing as you, the individual, move forward. <clears throat> nature in its ceaseless evolution is endlessly fruitful. The primary or fundamental movements of the new school of the dance must have within them the seeds from which will evolve all other movement in unending sequence. This unending sequence, and you can go, just blank it out, please. This unending sequence is like the waves of the ocean where Isadora first danced, and the waveform became an essential part of her technique. So today in choreography class, we're doing some of this, but you begin with a kind of a figure eight that's motivated from here, and it begins to travel, and she recognized that there were no straight lines in nature. We know there are crystalline forms, but if you think about uh, We've seen this. We've seen waveforms lately, have we not? And trees blowing in the wind, right? And we've seen the force of gravity in those terrible trees, where things go crashing to the earth. Um, so that when you do her work, and you know how the wave goes out and then it pulls back in, um, there's also like a lot of oppositional things. So again, as with ballet, you're sort of balanced, but with Duncan, there's always a sense of pull and lifting up against it as you go, right? This looks like I know a little long swing, but it's a little different. Right? Sorry, a few references for some of the, some of the long time dancers here. Oh, um, my mom, my mom, where am I? Um, she perceived, and uh, next slide please. One more, oh, yeah, there's our saying, this is ballet, keep going. There we go. She perceived the, um, the power of these waveforms in classical Greek art. Next step, next slide. There we go. And she was incredibly influenced by going to uh, London and seeing the Elgin Marbles. Um, and if you'll see, the way that the movement flows through the body. If you're standing straight on two feet, you're in ballet land again. But if you let your body go naturally, you get curves, you get waves. And this wave can generate future movement. So she was really inspired by this. And again, choreography class, we'll be learning some of her Tanagra figures where she, there's these beautiful little statues that inspired her, these little dancing statues, and we do various shapes that then show up in her choreography that's <laughs> Let's get away that one. Where am I? Let's see. 
She was inspired by scientific discoveries as well as theories. Next slide, please. She developed her art in an era when light waves and sound waves, as I said, were first harnessed. And she refers to this science in much of her writing. I sought the source of spiritual experience to flow into the channels of the body, filling it with vibrating light, the centrifugal force reflecting the spirit's vision. And in a letter to her lover, the scenic designer Gordon Craig, she wrote, it's all a matter of magnetic forces, same things that keep Earth circling about the sun in constant rhythmical waves of attraction and repulsion, making the complete harmony. I'm writing about dance waves, sound waves, light waves, all the same. While this may have been naive, these musings informed her movement and her choreographic expression. And dancing was a literal metaphor for humanity's connection to the universe. And you do this gesture, it's one of my favorite, call the universe. The final statement, and in some ways the most radical, um, of Isadora's belief and what she expresses in her dance is her confident assumption that dance is inherently spiritual. And this is so radical in our culture. Dance is linked with sex. Um, there were preachers in, in the Puritan era who preached against the evils of dancing, and the waltz was considered scandalous when people first waltz because you faced your partner and put your arms around each other, you weren't looking at the king anymore, and you whirled about, and guess what? Die and night in ecstasy. If you've never done a Viennese waltz, I hope you have the chance to do that someday. It's really gorgeous. <laughs> Throughout her writings, Isadora uses the word soul and refers to her dance as prayer. Some people pray one way and some another. Sometimes I dance mine, she says. Next slide, please. <coughs> Next slide. Out of order. Next slide. Okay. Um, she wrote of a dance that would be so pure, so strong, that people would say it is a soul we see moving. It is a prayer, this dance. Each movement reaches in long undulations to the heavens and becomes part of the eternal rhythm of the spheres. She was raised in a household that followed the humanist ideals of Robert Ingersoll, who thought of religion as a human creation, and rejected the guilt-laden Catholicism of her birth. But again, she clearly experienced dance as a spiritual expression. In a Parisian studio in 1900, she found what she believed to be the bodily home of the soul. I spent long days and nights in the studio, she wrote, seeking that dance which might be the divine expression of the human spirit through the medium of the human body. For hours I would stand quite still, my two hands folded between my breasts, covering the solar plexus. But I was seeking the central spring of all movement, the crater of motor power, the unity from which all diversities of movement are born. Some historians question this experience. I believe it. <coughs> I think that the, the solar plexus, and I'll say more about that in a minute. This, if everybody would do this for me, please. If you put your hands right here, what do you feel? What do you sense? What organs are you close to? Heart and your lungs, right? So if you're breathing deeply from here, just do that because it's always good to take a deep breath. Go right for it. But there's a young man there with a beautiful heart on his shirt. That's great. <laughs> oh, do another one. Why not? But that's right. I'm looking at the clock. We're good. Right? And from there, what happens is her movement reaches out. And so it's not about, maybe that king, her movement, it's not about her. It's about this connection from this spiritual source 
and it's the abstract expression of essential human experience. Again, very radical in dance. All the all the um, the dances at that time, even the great story ballets. And by the way, nobody in the West had seen Swan Lake at that time or the Nutcracker. They were all still in Russia. But like Giselle, the Romantic Ballet, it was still a story. Okay, and. Um, for Isadora, there's many, many dances that, she's, that she does that are pure experiences. The dance moves consist of just one constant fluid? Um, um, there's um, discrete movements, but, and the choreography, how they're put together, depends on, the, um, on the, what the dance is about. But um, there's no, um, how do I say this? You don't go in, there's things you practice over and over and over, like, you know, the footwork is really, you know, you're really, whew, it's a lot, you're all up on, on releve all the time, which is interesting, given the whole gravity thing, but for the ballet dancers, again, you're never all the way up on point holding it, and where you, what you work is not your gastrocnemius, but your soleus muscles, um, because you're always kind of doing this, this gravity thing, you know, this kind of motion thing. Um, so you learn things like, you know, like the Tanagra figurines, but there are sequences that are practically choreographic. Again, different from the ballet. They're, you know, you do, you do skip, but eventually, once you learn the skips, in the classes, you do patterns with other dancers so that you're an individual dancing in harmony with each other. Or like there's the calling, where you're calling somebody else. She says, I never dance alone. I dance in chorus. So there's movements that we come in after she died, we've come to name. But it's not about, okay, you know, um, Jean, 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 you know, it's not a different feeling. They're discreet, but they're also a part of this floor. Did I answer you? Yeah. Oh, yes, the solar plexus. Some historians question this experience. I absolutely believe it. I think that Western culture, as we talk about with dualism, we tend to understand the body as mechanical, as a machine. And so we treat the body that way. Um, you know, now there's all this talk of preventative medicine. Um, but normally, you know, we're brilliant at, you know, something breaks, you fix it, you need, you know, microsurgery and laser surgery, boom. You have a disease, you know, God forbid that, that, you know, um, really horrible, something like cancer or something like that. Okay, 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 we've got these huge drugs, you know, boom, wipe out the cancer. Thank goodness, and many of them do. And this is a great thing, but it's different from the Eastern conception of the body. Eastern medicine understands the body as an energetic body. If any of you have, you, I'm sure many of you do yoga, okay? Yoga is not medicine. Yoga, of course, it comes from a spiritual practice. But when you do the yoga positions correctly, it opens a flow of energy in your body. If any of you have ever gotten acupuncture, okay? Acupuncture is really interesting and it's a great illustration. And, um, if you have a headache, say, okay, um, first of all, we take an aspirin, right? But in Eastern medicine, if they're looking for the source of a headache, it may or may not be in your head or your neck muscles. You may have a headache because something's out of balance in your kidneys, and an experienced practitioner will find the meridian to connect and, and, and open, reopen the flow in a given meridian. It's a very different. <coughs> Understanding and experience of the body. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, anyhow, back to the solar plexus, right? I think all great charismatic performers of any style, actors, dancers, musicians, poets, um, whether they're on screen, whether they're um, you know, live, tap into this energetic body. That there's something that they are able to open the, their heart chakra, which is where the solar plexus is, right here. That there is this communion that happens with, with great performers. 
What it was said about Isadora was that she always improvised, a little bit back to your question, because her movement looked so free that no one could imagine. And if you read her writing, she spent hours in the studio. She wrote to Gordon Craig, I discovered the most wonderful new movement today. She spent hours until she had this experience, you know? And so what she put on stage, like all great art looks, simple. And for any of you who ever study her technique, there are not many steps. There's not much, the movement vocabulary is not large. But the subtlety, the difference between the amount of energy you put in and the breath and, I don't know, it just, it just it's, it's a huge, it, it, I never, I, I'm always learning. I never get tired of it, it, it which just always keeps expanding. And in fact, one of the special things I think that Isadora's technique gives to us, and for the dance teachers, and for me, it's obviously a foundational technique. It gives us access to this energetic body, which we can then carry into whatever style we're doing. Ballet land again. <clears throat> so in Duncan technique, um, let's see, you said that. Okay, Isadora as religious experience. Um, Nietzsche, even though he wrote of the death of God, is one source of Isidore's <laughs> concept of the soul as our link to the sublime. For Nietzsche, the dancer is the supreme human being because dancing allows humans to express more fully the eternal rhythms of creation and destruction. He said the entire symbolism of the body is brought into play and we are, for but a brief moment, primordial being itself. Scholars of her day condescended to Isadora, saying that as an emotional woman, she was incapable of understanding the great philosophers and sciences she studied. There is a contemporary dancer, theologian, philosopher named Kimmerer Lamothe, that's my favorite name anywhere, and Kimmerer says, Isadora was a dancer, and when she read Nietzsche, she just assumed he was talking about a real dancer. Well, of course. For Nietzsche, the dance, again, is dancer simultaneously the apex of human evolution and part of nature. And that's Darwin. Darwin links us to nature. What do you mean I'm a descendant from a monkey? You know, that sort of stuff. But it's much more subtle and complex with that. So Darwin, as you Nietzsche, saw humanity as a great evolutionary achievement. Um, and yet, he knew we were part of it. And dancers, for him, expressed that. He believed dancing nourishes our entire beings and frees our souls to rejoice. Every day I count wasted, in which there's been no dancing, he said. And apparently, there he was out of the hills of Switzerland, where he lived in the foothills of the Alps, and he would go walk and he would go dance every day. I try to picture what, he was not a very well man, and I try to picture what he must have looked like when he was out there. That's another story. In the dance of the future, Isadora affirms dance as a big experience of the spiritual. For her, dance was prayer as a state of being, not as supplication or work or worship, but a felt present tense communion with all creation. Isadora's integrated philosophy <coughs> shaped her beliefs about education. Can you go back one, please, dear, in the slides? Uh, yeah, we're good. These are her students that she taught in Russia. And go forward now one. And this is, no, back one. Go. This is Irma Duncan, her adopted daughter. She adopted six students. That's a long story I don't have time to go into. But she adopted <coughs> six of her pupils, and Irma was the one who was with her the longest, and who was the one who um, codified the movement exercises that we do to train in Duncan technique. Isadora herself um, was an incredible inspirer. She would go to her schools, and she would do this, and she would do that. And then she would look at the students, she would say, do this, do that, and they would quite know how to do it, and you know, she's like, this is so strange. I know how to do this, but I can't convey it. But she believed in the power of education 
And she believed that education, and this is now like the most contemporary education theory, that good education involves the whole person, physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual, right? And so this is her vision. What I want is a school of life. For a man's greatest riches are his soul, his imagination. Let us first teach little children to breathe, to become one with harmony at the movement of nature. Let us first produce a beautiful human being, a dancing child. And then you have all the alertness, the equipment to take in all the facts, all the details, all the, you know, and you practice, you know how to do that. So dance for her trained you to do everything. One of her innovations was to see choreography as the natural outgrowth of this individual expression. But great choreography for her was not self-expression. It expressed the individual essence within community, the chorus of democracy. But even when they are dancing together, each one, while forming part of a whole under group inspiration, will preserve a created individuality and all the parts together will compose a unified harmony. In effect, she danced with all humanity in the service of a larger ideal. I'm looking at I do have another couple of things. One of the things that we mentioned in the introduction was women's issues. What of the woman, the dancer of the future? Because it is described as a woman. She did say that when men dance, they will dance like God, but she also apparently said privately about her schools, I'm a woman alone. I don't think I can handle 40 little boys in my school. I'll take girls, thank you. Um, men look wonderful doing Duncan work because of the solar plexus and the massive power of her shoulders, but she in her day did not teach men. But in her day, the women's movement that she believed in, she wasn't a suffragist, suffragette. She wasn't concerned with the vote. She was concerned with the rights of the women in the home because in those days, when you married the man to control of everything, your body, remember, I'm sorry, I come from Missouri, Mr. Todd, Mr. Lieutenant Rape, huh? okay? And um, the, uh, your children, and certainly any, any financial resources that you might have brought with you. And that she fought against and spoke against. And her own experience of fatherless and impoverished childhood and painful childbirth sensitized her to this. Can we go forward, please? One more, keep going. Keep going. Did I pass it? Oh yeah, corsets, right? That's how women dress. And she believed, obviously, in women's clothing reform and freeing the body to dance and to move and to breathe. Isn't it something? You see the pregnancy corset I found. Next slide, please. This is her with her daughter, Deirdre, who she had with Gordon Craig, whom she never married by choice. Women should have the right to bear children by whom they choose. So she was shaped by all the theories of all of her teachers, but through her dance, she integrated them into something greater. She merged body, mind, spirit, and nature in her dance, and in the breath and movement of her work. Next slide, please. Here she is. And let me read to you now, finally, the closing statement of the Dance of the Future before I dance for you a little bit. The dancer of the future will be one whose body and soul have grown so harmoniously together that the natural language of the soul will have become the movement of the body. She will dance not in the form of nymph, nor fairy, nor coquette, but in the form of woman in her greatest and purest expression. She will dance the freedom of woman and realize the mission of woman's body and the holiness of all its parts. She will dance the life of nature, showing how each part is transformed into the other. From all parts of her body shall shine radiant intelligence, bringing to the world the thoughts and aspirations of thousands of women. She shall dance the freedom of women. This is the mission of the dancer of the future. Oh, she is coming. 
the dancer of the future, the free spirit who will inhabit the body of the new woman, more glorious than any woman that has yet been, the highest intelligence in the freest body. Um, I, I'm going to do two things with the screen up. Thank you. Two dances for you that were choreographed in about 1905 to the music of the book. The total dancing, I'm looking at the clock here, is about five minutes. I'm available for questions as long as you would like. If I had the right costume for this next dance, which is called the Furies, it would be a streaky, muddy, bloody looking, raggedy, long tunic. But in this situation, it's a little hard to change clothes. And um, so the first dance, it's a fury, and I need to run around a little bit because I don't know if any of you have ever seen it, but uh, am I really doing this now after standing so close? <laughs> um, the Furies from Greek mythology, the Irenes who were trapped in hell. And um, then after that, I'll walk off stage. Can get my little scarf back on and um, do for you also blessed spirits, also by the look. Did you all check the sound level before? We did. It's all good. Just, I'm sorry. Just Thank you. 